Well, welcome back. I am so glad you are here with us today for another round of At The Movies. I am Pastor Nick Berlanga, the Associate Pastor at Ann Arbor First United Methodist Church. And today, in the family service, we'll be looking at Coco, a film that talks about family and remembrance. And I'm Nancy Lynn. I'm the lead pastor here. In our regular service, we'll be looking at the film Jojo Rabbit, which helps us to question some of our own biases. Before we start, though, we want to let you know that since we can't be celebrating communion together, we're going to have a love feast a little bit later in the service. If you'd like to, you can pause the service now and go grab a cup of coffee or something else to drink, something to eat, and then you'll be ready when the time comes. We also would love to know that you worshiped with us. So there is an opportunity for you to register your attendance and to give us feedback. You can do that by using the link on our YouTube page or going to the church website. And with that, let's continue at, at the, the movies. The movies. <laughs> Good morning. Today's verse is from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as thee. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. It's 4th of July weekend, our annual celebration of independence and freedom. Despite COVID-19, it still feels like a weekend for fun. Trips to the beach, a family barbecue, possibly a few fireworks in the backyard, as we remember those who founded our country fought for freedom from England, and established our Constitution and Bill of Rights. Yet this year, our celebrations are happening just as we are also facing a very painful part of our national history. This country that we love was largely built on the backs of black and brown-skinned people taken from their homes in Africa and enslaved to work the plantations of our brand new country. Though slavery was legally abolished long ago, the systemic racism which continues to threaten the lives of African Americans is, in many ways, just another kind of enslavement. How does it happen that a country that was founded on principles of freedom and the right of each individual to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness can simultaneously be deeply embroiled in trading human beings as slaves. How did we manage to both fight for freedom for some and st steal away the freedom from others? The answer lies in our human vulnerability to dehumanize and objectify whomever we see as the other. And it's certainly not unique to the history of the United States. Throughout history, we see examples of one group or nation seeking to control or defeat another by taking away their humanity. Perhaps the most famous is the Third Reich and its effort to wipe out the entire European Jewish population. The question is, how do we, as followers of Christ, respond. And as odd as it sounds, Jesus would say, we must become like children. This is the last week of our sermon series, Faith at the Movies, in which we're exploring the theological themes found in recent films. Today's movie is Jojo Rabbit the story of a 10-year-old boy who has been fully indoctrinated into the Nazi movement in Germany, but then learns that his mother is hiding a Jewish teenage girl in their attic. 
Now, I have to be honest and say that for the first 30 minutes of this film, I really didn't like it. The comedy was too raw, almost too satirical, about a time in history that still feels like it should be treated with solemnity and sorrow. But in the end, I really did like it because it leads you on Jojo's journey from his learned fanaticism to love and to empathy. The film opens when Jojo is putting on his Hitler Youth uniform and getting ready to go to a Nazi youth training event. Jojo Betzler, 10 years old, today you become a man, he says to himself in the mirror. And then, I swear to devote all my energies and my strength to the savior of our country, Adolf Hitler. As he utters these words, Hitler himself, or a version of him at least, appears in the room with Jojo. It turns out that Hitler is not just the savior of the country, but also Jojo's imaginary friend. To help prepare Jojo for the day ahead, Hitler drills him on how to say Heil Hitler appropriately until Jojo bursts out of his home in excitement and runs through the streets crying, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler. Well, as the film deftly moves between Jojo's fanatical chant as he runs and actual news footage of crowds cheering for Hitler, we are quickly pulled into the hysteria of the time. And honestly, it's very uncomfortable. But I think our discomfort is the point. Once he arrives at the training, we quickly learn that Jojo is not the tough young soldier he would like to be. He is sensitive, observant, and easily overwhelmed, making him a great target for the older bullies. He does have one friend, Yorkie, and after an evening of book burning together, the two lie in their tent discussing the Jews. If I met one, I'd kill it like that, says Jojo. But how would you know? They, they could look just like us. I would feel its head for horns. Plus, you know they smell like Brussels sprouts. Oh, oh, that's right, Yorkie responds. I, I forgot the Brussels sprout bit. Well, the next day, Jojo ends up handling a live grenade, which explodes when he drops it, damaging his legs and cutting his face and arms. This makes him ineligible to be a soldier, but he doesn't lose his obsession with all things Nazi. There are propaganda posters on his bedroom wall, and his best friend is still the imaginary Hitler. One evening, when his mom is away, he hears strange noises upstairs. He finds a hidden door in a bedroom wall, and there, deep in the recesses of the attic, he finds Elsa, a Jewish teenager his mother is hiding from the Nazis. The rest of the story explores how through his friendship with Elsa, Jojo begins to doubt everything he's been taught about Jews and war and the superiority of the Aryan race. In the beginning, he says he won't tell the Gestapo that she's there as long as she will tell him everything he needs to know about Jews. Like, why do Jews hang from the ceiling like bats when they sleep? And where does the queen Jew lay her eggs? But by the end of the film, Jojo has fallen in love with Elsa in that innocent way that 10-year-olds do. The other person who challenges Jojo and his fanaticism is his mother, Rosie. Through the course of the movie, Jojo realizes that his mo mother is a member of the resistance. She hates the war while he glorifies it. She secretly puts out anti-war flyers on the streets, even as he hangs posters supporting the war effort. But he loves her, and she is full of energy and sparkle. 
One day on a bike ride, she tells him how it feels to fall in love. Love is the strongest thing in the world, she says. But Jojo responds, I think you'll find that metal is the strongest, followed by dynamite and muscles. She tries to tell him that he's growing up too fast, that he shouldn't be glorifying war, but climbing trees and falling out of them. Life is a gift, Jojo. We must celebrate it. We have to dance to show God how grateful we are to be alive. Dancing is for people who don't have a job. Dancing is for people who are free. How can he resist her? Both Elsa and Jojo's mom teach Jojo to look beyond the indoctrination he's gotten at school, beyond the dehumanization of Jews and the glorification of war, and help him to open to the power of love. I think that's where we find the theological theme in this movie. What we learn from Jojo Rabbit is that through relationship, our biases can be challenged and, albeit slowly, unlearned. That we can begin to see others with the innocence and acceptance of a child. Because that's what happens to Jojo. Through the conditioning of the Nazi party to prepare him to be a soldier, he lost his childhood. But through the love of his mother and his friendship with Elsa, he gets it back again. When people brought their children to see Jesus, the disciples tried to send them away. But Jesus said, no, let them come. The kingdom of God belongs to them. In fact, you will not enter the kingdom unless you become like them. In the kingdom of God, no individual or group is dehumanized or objectified. All of God's people are equally welcome, loved, and celebrated. Children seem to understand this naturally. As Nelson Mandela put it in his book, Long Walk to Freedom, no one is born hating another person because of their color of their skin or background or religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. How can we, like Jojo, reclaim that natural acceptance and love for others? Well, we start by checking our own biases. We all have them. We too have been taught, perhaps not with the flagrant propaganda of the Third Reich, but by our parents and our teachers, our society, and to some extent, our experiences. So what are yours? Do you hold more tightly to your purse when you see a young black man dressed in baggy shorts and high tops? Do you grow impatient with the Indian waiter when you can't understand his English? Do you get uncomfortable when you see someone obviously born male wearing a dress? Do you cross the street when you notice a homeless person with a cardboard sign asking for help? We have to be ruthlessly honest with ourselves and willing to name and acknowledge that we're part of a system that oppresses some people and rewards others. And then we have to seek out relationship, honest relationship and honest communication because it's really only through knowing a person who is African American or transgender or homeless or an immigrant, <clears throat> that we begin to see the fullness of their humanity. As we open our own hearts and minds, we're called to help others recognize their own biases as well, to create spaces where honest dialogue can happen, and to be brave enough to model for others what it looks like to be vulnerable and willing to learn. And finally, 
God calls us to continually hold out for humanity the hope of the kingdom of God. With all the hate and distrust and anger we see in our country today, it can be hard to hold on to that hope. Yet we are the followers of the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Love, the prophet who could see each person with the acceptance and love of a child. Jesus casts the vision of the kingdom of God. It is ours to help fulfill it. May it be so. Amen. This Sunday, we had a love feast. One way that you can continue to show love is through generosity. I want to say thank you to all the people who have been so generous during these last few months when we've been apart. It's easy to forget about the church and what the church does when we're not in the building, but you have not. And for that, I say thank you. In the next slide, there'll be instructions on how you can continue to give if you've been giving in the past, or if you would like to give for the first time. If after this service you would like to give, you can always go to the church website at fumc-a2.org, and there will be instructions there as well. Thank you, and God bless you. So 
Oh, people get ready. There's a train coming. You don't need no baggage. You just climb on board. All you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. And you don't need no ticket. You just pray. Well, today, if we were worshiping together in the sanctuary, we would be celebrating Holy Communion together. But we're not together. And so instead, we'll take advantage of a long Methodist tradition called the Love Feast. You know, when we break bread together as a church in worship, we remember that Jesus invited folks to his table throughout his ministry, not just at the Last Supper. So we wanted to create a way for all of us to break bread together, even if we're in our homes and not in the sanctuary. So if you haven't already, before you continue, take a moment to grab a favorite drink and something to eat. Could be coffee and pancakes or juice and cereal, whatever gives you comfort. Jesus used the parable of a great banquet to which all people are invited in order to talk about the kingdom of God, the family of God. He said, go to the highways and back alleys and urge people to come in so that my house will be filled. He often invited the most unlikely guests to his mealtimes, confounding the disciples. In this way, he was encouraging a deep love and connection beyond social norms. He knew that we humans need connection and inclusion. Jesus comforts us, saying, You have a place at the table. And Jesus challenges us to make sure we are doing the same, that all people know that they are welcome in our hearts, in our homes, in our churches, even if we can't physically be with each other right now. It is difficult in this moment not to be near some people that we love and might be worried about. So take a moment and say out loud the names of people you wish were right next to you at your table today. Jesus is no longer physically on earth, yet every time we gather around a table, and we call him to mind, he is present with us in spirit. And so too, our loved ones are with us. Let this be a comfort to us. We also want to call to mind the people we can't name, whose names we don't know, but we know they need our prayers and God's comfort. And so we pray for those who have lost loved ones, for those who are sick and recovering, for those who are caring for loved ones who are sick at home, for those who are caring for persons in medical care, for those who are separated from loved ones, for those who are feeling alone and isolated, for those who are helping and are so very tired, for those who are struggling to find friends, food, and comfort for those who are afraid. I invite you now to take a deep breath on behalf of all those we do not know and cannot call by name. As we do, we know that God knows who needs our prayers and the spirit, the breath of God, is blowing from within us outward as a spirit of compassion and presence. Blessings at the table are part of our Judeo-Christian heritage. 
Indeed, Jesus adapted his Jewish ritual blessing spoken before and after meals. He asked us to remember him whenever we break bread or raise a cup in thanksgiving. And this is why we call our communion prayers the Great Thanksgiving. In this feast of love and comfort, we can call to mind things to which we are deeply grateful. I invite you to speak aloud a couple of things that you are grateful for in this moment. And so I invite you to raise a plate of something on your table or a glass of whatever you're drinking and let us bless it in this way, repeating after me there at home. Holy Comforter, we gather in your name, invited by Jesus, bound together by your spirit in union with each other. Feed our bodies and our spirits with your comforting presence so that we might be your comfort for others. Bless this food and break open our hearts Bless this drink and pour out your love. Amen. As you continue your meal, I invite you to imagine what extravagant love looks like as you reach across the social distance to loved ones, to friends, and even acquaintances or strangers. And now may the peace and comfort of Christ be present with you now and forevermore. Amen. I invite you to join me in the prayer that unites brothers and sisters around the world and across time. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, 
Well, thank you so much for joining us at the movies. Come back next week when our Minister of Congregational Care, Amy Kennedy, will be leading our worship service. Until then, we hope you've enjoyed your time with us and we look forward to seeing you soon. Go in peace.